Acts chapter 27. We're getting closer and closer to the end of the book here. We're going to talk about, in this session, Paul's voyage in shipwreck. Uh, Paul, uh, as you recall, way at the end of his third missionary journey, ended up in Jerusalem. He went to Jerusalem. He had been warned against going there, but he went to Jerusalem to spend time at the, I believe it was the Pentecost feast. And uh, while he was there, uh, he created quite a stir among the Jews. And so the story from chapter 21, really up to chapter number 26, all the different circumstances that Paul has gone through since he created this stir among the Jews and, and preaching to them in Jerusalem. He's been in the custody of a, uh, a captain, a military captain. He's been in the custody of, uh, I think his name was Lysias, Publius Lysias or whatever. But um, he's been under uh, a Felix, Festus. Uh, he's been to Agrippa. Uh, in all of these different situations, he has also had opportunities to stand before Jewish elders, the Sanhedrin, and uh, <clears throat> he's made an appeal to avoid uh, being ambushed by the Jews. He's made an appeal uh, to go to Rome, to stand as a Roman citizen. He had the right to stand before the Roman emperor and plead his case. Now, he's already been before um, various civil authorities who have... Uh, actually dismissed the whole thing and said, I, I don't see what the point is here. I don't see any uh, issue, civil issue, that Paul has violated. Uh, this is a religious issue. This is between uh, these Jewish people and Paul, and I don't, you know, I don't even know what they believe or why they believe it, and as far as I'm concerned, I don't believe any of it. That's why uh, the, the civil authorities were, these Roman authorities, um, Herod Agrippa ends up getting in, involved because Agrippa has uh, the Jewish background and he has good understanding in these things. But it, in every case, um, these individuals, these civil authorities and King Agrippa, they all agree that what Paul is saying is not in violation of Roman law. The Jews are hell-bent, so to speak, on destroying Paul the Apostle. They hate the message of the gospel. They hate the idea of the resurrection of Christ. Of course, I mean, this goes all the way back to the crucifixion of Christ. And it goes, it goes before that when they conspired to kill him. Uh, I believe there's a passage way back in the Gospel of John when uh, these Jews had conspired to eliminate Jesus himself. But anyway... Um, as we, as we get into Paul's life, he's made these appeals and he's been freed in the sense that he's freed from the charges that have been made, but he's made an appeal to stand before the emperor uh, Caesar, Augustus Caesar. And so he's on his way there. And chapter 27 speaks of the famous shipwreck. If you notice uh, here in uh, page 295 is where we are. What do prisons and storms and shipwrecks and snake bites all have in common? They each, after significant rearrangements, spell disaster. Indeed, we employ these terms metaphorically to refer to significant trials and tests disrupting our own personal lives. It is possible that a prison, a storm, a shipwreck, or a snake bite is so disastrous that it could even spell death being caught in one of these disasters is distressing enough for one lifetime. Imagine being caught in all four disasters in the space of just a few weeks. For one person, Paul, to experience all four of these disastrous scenarios at once and still live to tell about it is utterly amazing. If I were a life insurance company, I would want people like Paul to buy my life insurance policies. This guy was uh, impervious to harm. They couldn't, until God said your life is over, his life was not going to be over. 
Within the text of 27, a significant theme of salvation develops. Now this is when I say salvation, there's a picture or a type of salvation in this shipwreck. And we point those things out along the way in the text. And we'll, we'll see that where there is a picture, a type, or a symbol of salvation. So um, obviously the shipwreck itself is a symbol of people's lives being spiritually shipwrecked and being on the verge of drowning and losing their physical lives. They, we can come alongside that with an analogy of our lives can be in a shipwreck in a, of sorts, analogically, and uh, we can find ourselves in a position where we are on the verge of spiritual death as a result of that. So we see the outline in chapter 27 on the middle of page 295. And again, we've given you quite a bit of commentary on this chapter. I think some good commentary and certainly worthy to take in. Let's look at 27.1. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. And entering into a ship of Adramedium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coasts of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty. We use that term even today in the military when you get a weekend pass or something like that you are given liberty or freedom so he's given liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself and when we had launched from thence we sailed under cyprus because the winds were contrary and when we had sailed over the sea of cilicia and pamphylia we came to myra a city of lycia so we're drawing uh uh, closer and closer here to the conclusion of the book of Acts. But this particular chapter deals with several different locations and incidents that take place on the way to Rome. In chapter 27, verse number 6, we read, And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, Italy excuse me, and he put us therein. And when we had sailed slowly many days and scarce were come over against Nidus, the wind not suffering us, it was contrary, we sailed under Crete over against Salmone, and hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto the city of Lycia. So um, the author of the book of Acts, uh, Luke, is... Uh, giving us some details, very carefully giving us details about this particular journey. Notice uh, it says in verse 7, and when we had sailed, we, first person plural, Luke is identifying himself as being part of what is taking place. This isn't some uh, incident that someone just uh, related to him were relayed to him many, many years later. He kind of picked up a few facts. He's actually recording where they went. You can get a map and, uh, and locate these places, and actually you can see uh, the course of this particular journey uh, that Paul took. And um, you say, well, what is the benefit of all of this? What it does is it validates, it substantiates the authority of the story. This isn't just a made-up fairy tale story. This is a story that is being told, a true story, that uh, has facts, places, individuals, people, scenarios, happenings that took place, storms that took place at certain times of the year when the winds were contrary to the uh, uh, to sailing. And uh, people who are familiar with this area of the world could read this and say, I can identify with that. I understand what he is saying here. That's the way it is, 
even today. So these things are not incidental. They're not just accidental. They're placed in here. People, places, things are placed in the book of Acts to validate the history and document the history that these are genuine and real happenings that have take, p- taken place. And I know that we have said that before, but it bears repeating from time to time. Lest we kind of get lost. It's easy to start reading the Bible and look at the Bible as though it's a story about something that took place a long time ago and has no bearing on our lives today. <clears throat> or it took place, or it didn't take place at all. It's just a story that was Uh, somewhat true, but it's been enhanced quite a bit. I don't know if you've ever been uh, to a movie and uh, they advertise the movie this way. They say the movie is based on a true story. What does that mean? That means that they've picked up a few facts and then they've, uh, they've built a story, a novel, a fictitious story around some of the facts. So watching this particular movie, it's not a true story. There are some true things in the story. In fact, there's a lot of uh, literature uh, that's written this way. Uh, Some authors have really picked up on these historical facts, and then what they do is they, they research them out, they get them down, and then they write a whole novel or fictitious story surrounding genuine facts. And people enjoy reading historical novels, I guess is what you would call it. I I don't know. I'm not into historical novels. But uh, I can see how people could do that and why people would write them. So anyway, uh, if you notice the second, or the last paragraph on page 297, the departure from Myra was underway, but the sailing was slow, going due, again, to the disfavorable winds during the fall winter seasons. See, we know these things to be true, and uh, we're, so we're just establishing credibility here of the text. It took several days to reach Nidus, which was about 130 miles west of Myra. Bach, Daryl Bach notes, this trip should have taken only a couple of days given the average speed of such ships at about six miles per hour, but the trip took much longer than that because it was not commodious for sailing. The weather was not good for sailing in the direction that they were going. So we pick things up in uh, verse 9 on 298, 27.9. Now, when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous, certain times of the year, you don't want to be out. We uh, We have a lake uh, near us. We are, uh, Rochester, New York, is uh, right on uh, one of the great lakes, Lake Ontario. Lake Ontario is about 180 miles long and about 60 miles wide, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around 600 feet deep. So it's almost like an ocean. If you went to Lake Ontario and stood at the shore, you cannot see the other side 60 miles away. It's a big body of water. Well, consequently, when there is so much open water, you get some winds at various times of the year uh, coming across, coming out of northwest, out of the northwest, out of Canada, or out of the north crossing that. You can get some real nasty uh, weather out on Lake Ontario where I don't care what kind of a vessel you have, any kind of pleasure vessel, you do not want to be out there. I know of waves uh, hitting the shore when I was younger of 10 to 12 foot waves on a lake. Now we're not talking about the ocean now, we're talking about 10 to 12 foot waves on on one of the great lakes. Well anyway, you don't want to be in a big body of water at the wrong time of the year is what I'm saying, okay? Sailing was dangerous, 27.9, because the fast was now already passed. Again, that's giving us an idea what time of the year was this. The fast was probably, this is fall, it's probably the Day of Atonement, 
which would put the time of the year around September, October uh, here on uh, this body of water. So it says that it was dangerous because the fast was now already passed. Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading, the load, the lading of the ship and ship, but also of our lives. This is not just going to, we're not going to just lose cargo. Uh, we're going to lose the ship and we are in danger of losing our lives. This could be catastrophic. So I'm warning you right now, this will be with hurt and much damage, verse 10 says. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken of by Paul. Of course, I, I can see why the centurion, the Roman soldier, uh, he's listening to the prisoner. He's listening to the preacher boy down here tell him about sailing on this great body of water. Nah, nah. The Capitan here, he knows what's going on out here. If he feels safe out here, I feel safe with him. So he'd rather listen to the, uh, listen to the captain of the ship uh, than listen to the, the prophet or the preacher, Paul the Apostle. So uh, picking up the text, we look at uh, verse 11 again. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship, more than those things which are spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, simply meaning that this uh, harbor uh, was too, um, too, too wavy, too turbulent in the winter time. It wasn't a safe harbor at this time of the year. The harbor was, it was just as bad being in the harbor as it was being out on the open water, apparently. And so it's not commodious to winter in. The more part advised to depart thence also. And if by any means they might attain to Phoenice and there to winter. So we're going to try to get to a better place to winter. But Paul says, eh, you're asking for it which is in haven of Crete and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And again, here's uh, directions, locations, geographical locations that you can find on a map bringing credibility to the story. Well, anyway, Paul's counsel is rejected. We look at the top of page 299 and the ship launches forth at the... Uh, encouragement and with the advice of the captain of the ship we head out and they are caught in a great storm in a, a storm called Eurachlodon. Acts 27 13. And when the south wind blew softly supposing that they had obtained their purpose <laughs> it lured them in. This is just what they want. This is perfect sailing weather for us. Nice, soft south wind. They launched out. Loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlodon. Eurachlodon. This is a, a storm of hurricane force winds. And you're out in this body of water in these huge swells on a ship that you wonder if it's going to stay together. How well has this been built, this ship? Is it going to uh, be able to take the pressures that will be inflicted upon it by the waves and the tossing and turning, not only of the waves, but internally, we got to get the cargo under control or we're just going to get, we're going to get killed by being hit by cargo flying around on the inside of the ship. So anyway, and when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. It, could, it wouldn't go forward. We let her drive. We just had to basically take the sails down, point it into the wind, and the wind pushed us around wherever it wanted to. So basically, we wanted to keep the ship upright, facing into the wind, but we had no control 
of our direction. We had to go in the direction that the wind was forcing us to go. If you've done any sailing at all, even on a little sailboat, you'll understand what's going on uh, here. When the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive, and running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which, when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, strake sail, and so were driven. Driven. They are using every kind of technique that they can to save this vessel, to get this vessel to go in a reasonably safe direction. So what they did is, it says they used helps. And uh, from my understanding is, what they did is they undergird the ship. I mean, this, this, this big ship, they put these uh, uh, cables underneath the uh, uh, hull of the ship and tied the thing together so that the ship would uh, have extra support. So when it got shaken, it would be shaken together as one one, uh, entity rather than having things being loosened up and eventually coming apart. So they used helps undergirding the ship. So they used uh, cables to undergird the ship to tie it together. And fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, they didn't even really know where they were going here. If we end up into, and if we uh, end up in the quicksands, we're going to ground this ship, and uh, we're going to be in real. Once we ground the ship, then the waves are really going to beat on it. The ship is stuck in one place. It ends up being turned sideways. The wind hitting it or the waves hitting it on the side. Horrible, horrible situation. They had no control of the ship at this particular time. So they're trying to do everything they can. They strike sail. And so we're driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lighten the ship. We've got to get rid of some of this cargo. Obviously, the more junk you have on the ship, the greater the draft of the ship. The ship sinks deeper into the water. You put more stuff on it, and the ship goes down, down, down. So the sides of the ship, maybe the sides of the ship are, you know, I don't know, say six feet out of the water. You load that ship up with all kinds of, uh, of uh, cargo, And what happens is it begins to sink. And now the sides of the ship are only four feet out of the water or three feet out of the water. And so the waves uh, can much more easily uh, go over the side of the ship and fill the ship up with water. So they're looking at how deep the ship is sitting, the draft of the ship, and they're deciding we got to get rid of some of our stuff and pick this ship up out of the water. So, uh, in uh, verse 18, they lightened the ship, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. Not only have we got rid of our cargo, the lading, but now we're getting rid of all of our tools, our sails, the tackling, all of this other stuff that's on there that is important to sailing. It's going to take us down. We're better off taking our chances by just throwing everything overboard and getting this ship to sit as high as it possibly can in the water. The, this, the, uh, this is uh, a very uh, severe set of circumstances for sailors to do anything like this. This is dangerous. We cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared... Now, why is that important? Because sailing was done by the stars. They had clouds, constant cloud cover. They had, essentially, no idea where they were. They didn't know where they were. They had no reference point 
and the stars in the sky to determine where are we? What direction are we going in? They didn't know what direction they were going. They didn't know where they were. They had no way to really navigate at this particular time. So there's no sun, there's no stars, and no small tempest lay on us. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. We're just waiting for this thing to go under. There's nothing else we can do. We don't know where we are. We have thrown all of our tackle overboard. We have uh, uh, jettisoned all of our cargo overboard. The ship right now is sitting about as high as it can in the water, but we're taking on water, and we can't, we're taking on water faster than we can get rid of it. It's just a matter of time when these waves are going to just uh, tear the ship apart or the ship is going to fill up with water and we are going down. Now Paul warned them, did he not? There's 276 people on this ship. So we're not talking about a little Chris craft out on the lake. We're not talking about a 24-foot little fishing boat that you might have or water skiing boat that you have. There's 276 people who are on this boat. Why don't we start throwing some people overboard? Well, I'm sure that crossed their mind. Some of these prisoners were looking like, you know, you look a little hefty there. Maybe we ought to get rid of you. You're leading our ship down. Well, anyway, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. Well, if we go to the bottom of the page, Paul encourages them, 27, 21. 27 in 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst. I mean, this went on for quite a while. It must have been, the only noise was the, the wind and the crashing of waves and maybe a whimper now and then. But it was quieter than a turkey farm on Thanksgiving afternoon on this ship. It was a matter of waiting for the worst to happen. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me. <laughs> it's always nice to have somebody like that around. Isn't it? I told you so. I told you we're going down. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. That makes us feel a lot better now. Not only are we going to drown, but we were wrong. <laughs> so you're just pouring salt in the wounds. Leave us alone. Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. This wouldn't have happened if you listened to me. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for these shall, for, excuse me, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. <coughs> well, we're going to lose the ship. We're not going to lose any life. There's 276 people on this. So how in the world are we going to lose the ship, but we're not going to lose any lives? I mean, that's a puzzle in and of itself, isn't it? And I imagine they stopped and said, that's crazy. How can we lose the ship and not lose somebody or some of the passengers on the ship? For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given them to all them that sail with thee. Therefore, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it, is e it shall be even as it was told me, howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. Well, at this particular situation, they should have listened to Paul before, and that's become pretty apparent. That's pretty clear, no doubt about that. And they didn't. Well, maybe we ought to listen to him this time. What else do we have to lose? We're just sitting here waiting to drown. We're just sitting waiting for this ship to come apart, and life will be over. It'll just be a matter of time then. Well, okay, so Paul says we're going to lose the ship, but we're not going to lose any man's life, not one. So the ship approaches land, 27, 27. But when the 14th 
night was come. Can you imagine going through this? The 14th night was come as we were driven up and down in Adria. About midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Now, it wasn't that they saw the land, I don't think. What they could tell is that they were in shallow waters, 20 fathoms, 15 fathoms. So the the water is getting shallower and shallower, which is a sign that we're getting closer and closer to some piece of property, land. Then fearing, lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern, that's the backside, stem to stern, stem is the front, stern is the back, and wished for the day. So what they decided to do is put these anchors out, all of them, and uh, hold the ship still where we are. And when daylight would come, then they would be able to get a little uh, better understanding of where they were. For 14 days, the ship was cast about like a twig in a raging river. But God had protected the ship from destruction and from many hazards and provided hope amidst the disaster. At some point, while in the Adria Sea, they began to observe signs of land. They cast their measuring device into the water and noted a depth of 20 fathoms, about 120 feet, and shortly measured 15, about 90 feet. At this point, the crew cast off the the anchors to the stern to drag the bottom to keep the ship from running headlong into the shore and prayed for the day to come so they could figure out where they were, what was going on with their situation. So let's pick up our reading here in uh, verse 30. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, they were... uh, faking it, in other words. They were going to save themselves. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Some of the crew were going to get while the getting was good, and they weren't going to worry about the other people. They weren't going to worry about the passengers on the ship. Fact of the matter is that these were the people that knew, if anyone knew how to handle a crisis situation at sea, These were the people, and they were all going to leave and save themselves and leave the rest of them to die. So Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you can't be saved. If they leave, you're dead. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. Guys, you're not going anywhere. You're staying right here with us. Verse 33. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, get something to eat, some food, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not in hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all, And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer. They all took something to eat themselves, some meat. And we were in, we, Luke, we, the author, we were in all, we were all in the ship, 200, three score, 60 and 16, 276. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, cast out the wheat, into the sea. The only thing that they had saved was some food, something to eat. And even at this point, they get rid of the food out of the ship. So let's pick up. Let's go to the end of the chapter here, all right? 39. When it was day, they knew not the land. They didn't recognize the shore. They didn't know where they were. But they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which... They were minded, this is a good place to land the ship, if it were possible to thrust in the ship. 
And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoist up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground in the fourth part stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. You can see that. They're making for shore, put the sail up, they head in toward shore, and they're heading for this creek area, and uh, they're looking. If we can just get into that creek, get the ship into there, then we've got shore on both sides here. It'll be a lot easier for us to escape and to get off this vessel. So they head in there, but as they're heading in, they run aground. They run aground, uh, and, uh, the be and the ship is pointed in towards land. The waves are crashing on the backside of the ship and literally tearing this thing apart. So it's time to leave. It's time to get off the ship. So, in falling into a place where two seas met, verse 41, they ran the ship aground in the forepart, front, stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. 42. And the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on boards, some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came, it came to pass that they escaped all safe to the land. They all escaped safe to the land. The soldiers who were responsible for the criminals initiated a plan to kill the prisoners, lest they should escape to the land and get free. It was a law that if a Roman soldier allowed a criminal to escape under their watch, then the soldier would have to pay the penalty of the prisoner. And in some cases, that would be death. This is why the jailer in Acts chapter 16, he was about to take his own life when he realized, when he thought that all the prisoners had escaped uh, from the prison in that chapter. So we have some application of the text there on page 303 at the bottom. There is a picture, as we said, throughout the commentary here and at the end, a picture of salvation and staying with the ship. So uh, Paul leads a very in interesting life, does he not? When you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, all of the different things that he has been through. through. But yet, and I said this maybe a session or two ago, I said this. I said, you know, Paul always used the obstacles as opportunities to speak to another group of people, a broader group of people, a larger group of people. So obstacles always became Paul's opportunities. Don't forget that. Uh, we often shirk from uh, obstacles because we don't want to have to bear the pain of the obstacle or the frustration of trying to overcome the obstacle. But at the same time, on the other side of that obstacle, there may be great opportunity. So um, we've been at this for uh, a few minutes now, more than 30 minutes. Let's take a break right now, and then we will come back to the last chapter, Acts chapter 28.